What's up, my friends? How y'all doing today? Carpo with a cup of coffee. And uh, a moment of thought, I guess. This subject that I came up with this morning, every morning I have a different idea about what to talk about, but it's very hard to put it down into a video without preparing for it. Sometimes I'll prepare for a video by maybe you know, researching or taking a few notes, but most of the time it's just spur of the moment kind of thing, and um, if I have an idea in mind, I'll just pop in and make a video while I'm thinking about it. And the times that I don't do that, whatever I'm thinking about tends to fade away, and I regret not talking about it because I forget. I had a subject for this video, or one video I was going to make, but uh, it just slipped past me, and uh, I think that that's kind of what happens to us all the time in life. Everything seems to slip past us. It's the memories we have, the happy moments. Of course the mind is designed to filter out the sad moments. If you look at the way that the brain works, it's it's a good thing that we forget a lot of things in our life because we would be very confounded and distracted if we had um, if we had uh, to constantly ponder all the different mistakes that we've made. And a person could take it to say, well, we'd also see the great decisions we've made. But overall, the human mind is, uh, is ca very capable of remembering the good times and forgetting the bad times, and that's how we deal with stress. But we can't forget the bad times completely because then we will repeat the same mistakes, right? But what it comes down to for me here is uh, to start off with a point, what's important? What is really important to do in life? Is there anything that's actually important for a human being to do? And I'm omitting basic values, attitudes, and things that don't have any physical bearing on others, such as, you know, the way that you conduct yourself in your daily life. It's going to depend strongly on the area you live in. There is no one-size-fits-all, and that realization for me has been a major component in the way that I think. Eliminating xenophobia from the vocabulary <laughs> and realizing that every culture has a system in place which suits it. And often, especially with the breakthrough of technology in the last 50 years, which has revolutionized even third world countries to where I believe that there are six billion cell phones in the world and only like half of that you know only like four billion that have actual access to permanent fresh drinking water because technology is easy to move around and to give to people it's easy to build a tower and to give cell phones or computers I imagine within the next 20 years <laughs> everybody's gonna have a tablet in third world countries. I don't mean everyone, obviously, but anyone who wants access. And this is this is a complicated issue because technology is moving faster than resources, okay? This is where I, uh, one of the realizations, I guess, that we need to make that the technology that we have, <clears throat> in order to make it fully capable of being utilized in the society by everyone, it requires a lot of resources to build the infrastructure. And and this is where we've run into a big problem. Uh, it, I can only speak for, let's say, the U.S. where I live. In the United States, we have an aging infrastructure. Most of the cities have lead pipes somewhere. Uh, most of the cities still have problems with the water pipes themselves falling apart and breaking over time. And many many of these were built, you know, 50, 60 years ago and are still being utilized. Now with the new technology they're able to take say an old cracked water pipe and they can clear the pipe out, drill down, and they basically put in a pipe condom if you will. It's like they they blast a resin on the inside of the pipe which coats the outside. Now this this is a huge thing because the cost to replace the pipes underneath the ground as well as the wires and cables and everything that holds our society together is something that is overlooked because we only see what's on top of the ground. And it's very difficult to see technology moving forward with all these, this amazing potential, yet we're not even able to repair or replace our own infrastructure here in the U.S. 
And um, while a, a lot of um, advancing countries right now who may have been in a completely different state of mind as well as technology, say, 20, 30 years ago, the ones that are growing fast, these are countries that are able to utilize modern technology to build their infrastructure more properly with longer duration so they'll hold together better. And they're also able to plan based on the mistakes that other countries have made, such as population growth, urban boundaries, and, uh, and all of this interferes with the individual's rights, let's say, to live. A person may say, hey, I want to expand my farmland, and they'd say, well, no. Um, because of this right or, or this law or that law that protects this area or that. And when it becomes a personal thing, people want to fight the system. They want to think that the system is holding them back from doing what they want to do. And meanwhile, there may be 20 people that are opposed to the one person, the 20 people being on the side of, hey, we're trying to protect this land. And let's say the one rancher that says, no, I want to be able to allow my, my cows to graze on this land. We could look at the old, the, the thing that happened with the... Um, I'm sure many of you remember the, the Bundy thing that happened down there in uh, Nevada where, you know, his cows, he refused to, you know, bring them in uh, off of, you know, whatever federal land and it became this huge issue and standoffs with guns and people are very touchy about their rights, but the issues are always more complicated than someone just coming in and taking something from you because all of the people in this country are affected by the decisions that people make. And I think this is overlooked a lot. When a person wants freedom of space, freedom to do what they want, it cannot come at the cost of anybody else's freedom. But what about this grandfathered in freedom that people seem to think that we have? And this is a touchy subject for a lot of people. It's, it's, the, it's the, the idea of bringing the forefathers back into it. Whenever a person gets into a discussion about, you know, what we should do with our country, with our world, moving forward, and people would say, well, this isn't what the forefathers wanted, or this is what the forefathers wanted, and and I hate to be the one to step, step up and say, I don't give a shit what the forefathers wanted, but I really don't. I mean, why do we think that people over 200 years ago coming to this country, the ideals and values that they had in place are this, the ones that we will still have today? In many regards, it is. The Constitution, you know, the Bill of Rights, these are things that protect us, but at the same time, um, the, the reason why we make amendments is because times change. And now, in the last 50 years, things have changed so much that there seems to be no agreement on whether we should move forward or move backwards. And it's a very difficult thing. So, for the individual, how do we know? what's right and wrong, and, and what decisions to make, what to stand behind, what values to have, what's actually important. What is important to fight for in this world? I mean, there are folks, let's say, that uh, dedicate their lives to uh, fighting to save the panda, let's say, or the whale. And I saw a really interesting little, uh, it was just a little video a while back, it was saying, why don't we protect the you know, the, the pygmy rattlesnake or, you know, all these random animals that we've never heard of. And uh, these, some of them have a very strong bearing on the environment. In other words, if this animal disappears, it causes a huge problem with the food chain. If pandas disappeared, it wouldn't cause a damn problem to this earth, okay? But they're beautiful animals, and we believe that since they're endangered, they're something to protect, and that's you know, that's, that's something that humans can uh, battle over on their own value system, whether or not we should be standing up, or whether or not uh, we're actually causing these extinctions, and in many regards, um, we probably are causing the death of many animals and, and each other. But that's not my point. My point is that we tend to want to protect what moves us, okay? And when we see something beautiful, something wonderful, we stand up and protect it more than we do some of the more grungy realities of life, which is that being a human is messy. It, it, I feel like sometimes we don't want to talk about the negative things, you know? We want to hide behind the, you know, positivity. But at the same time, it goes the complete opposite direction for a lot of folks who are constantly dwelling on the what-ifs, the negatives, the conspiracies, and all this stuff. And I'll tell you, a decade ago, I was infected by that virus. The virus of the Illuminati, the conspiracy, the New World Order, 
the belief that, you know, these giant FEMA camps are going to ship, you know, U.S. citizens into these FEMA camps. And after a decade of processing and thinking about it, I, I always thought, I eventually come to the conclusion of, if there's really an elite that's in charge of the world, and that we are the slave economy, and in many regards that's true, then what good would it do to devastate that economy and to throw people in prison camps, which ends up costing them more time and money? It just doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. So while there may be a few people who want to destroy society, <clears throat> in general, dwelling on it is not going to go anywhere because a majority of people don't want that. And people will fight, you know, they'll fight to the end to protect their way of life. It's like folks say if somebody invaded the United States, we would defend our soil, just like any country would, you know. I don't care if it's a, what foreign invader it may be, but I'd also defend my country against, like they say, you know, terrorists, foreign and domestic. And so the question becomes, who's really terrorizing this country, you know? Who's terrorizing this world? Is it Al-Qaeda? Or can we root this thing back to, you know, you talk about Al-Qaeda and ISIS as being the biggest threats, and, and in a lot of people's mind, this is, this is true. But of course, it's only certain westernized countries that fear this, you know. Um, you don't hear about attacks in, in South Korea or like, you know, China or, or Japan from, you know, Islam terrorists, because we've brought the fight to our own table. And then we have people up there like Trump saying he wants to deport all the Muslims and that kind of stuff. I, this is the kind of stuff that just, I just don't understand how people can't see how this is going to cause more problems. Trying to fight a problem rather than dealing with the problem is where we fall short as, as a country, as a society, that we think we can beat people into submission. And if you look back through history, that's never been the case. We've never been able to convince anyone that our view is the right one by beating it into them. Oh, sure, there are cases of, you know, people having their minds wiped and controlled by, um, you know, being reprogrammed. Uh, a lot of countries would send people to uh, reprogramming camps where they'd have to relearn how to support their communist dictator or support their, you know, uh, democratic leader. But you could bring bring it to the basics of, you know, right and left wing here in the U.S. You know, who is right and who's wrong? I definitely would not say I'm a liberal, but I definitely would not say I'm a conservative. You know, I don't want to be liberal with other people's stuff, but I don't want to be conservative with old values that don't work anymore. So in the middle, I become an independent thinker, a person who believes that everyone should be independent. But groupthink is such a strong part of our world. It's such a strong part of our society, you just can't escape it. Everybody wants to be part of something. And this is something that's taken me a few years to really process. I've been thinking about this after having a couple discussions with people that said that, you know, that being part of any group is a bad thing, that, you know, joining groups, you know, is like a weakness, and, uh, and that people need to be independent. But, but my thought is that we get back to the consensus reality of people. We need to know what people are thinking. We can't go on just what we believe to be true because it's so subjective and so based on the bullshit that we've learned. And constantly, every day, I'm fighting to change the way that I think because any little improvement I can make to my own reality will be reflected into the world by the way that I think and the way I behave. When you go through a lot of repeating patterns, on your daily basis, the going to work, seeing the same people, driving in the same traffic, you know, even dropping my kid off at school and seeing the same parents park in the middle of the road and, and you know, all the different things that might annoy you on a daily basis, just little things. So just kind of step back and laugh at that. And, uh, but there's a happy, there's a, there is a happy medium here because at one point, and this is the problem I had was a few years back, I tried to take it to an extreme by just letting it all go by always putting out positivity into the world and, you know, reap what you sow kind of thing. But when I see something negative, I instantly lash out. It's, it's become just, it's just who I am. It's always who I've been. And even when I've tried to just go with the flow, as they say, it's difficult because when I see something wrong, I just, I point at it. I can't help it. But I also realize that I need to step back from my subjective opinion, get a better grasp on what's going on before I understand it. And this is where groupthink comes in. Um, it's not groupthink, it's rather 
what you might call the peer review. <laughs> Just like in science, you can't make a discovery and claim it to be true. It needs to be peer reviewed and repeatable. And in this world, we can't use an example of what one country did, such as comparing Nazi Germany to current states of affairs, or saying, oh, we've already been through this with Rome or other places. It's a new world. It's different. And we have to think past the shortcomings that we have on being built on the past that is now gone, and now we're living in a very, very digital age, a very technological age, where things have completely changed, and we have to go with it. You really have to. You can't say the kids of today and their computers or their iPhones. It's easy for me to say, oh, Facebook sucks because everybody's just posting nonsense. And I do say that. But at the same time, it's a very important tool. So look at the Internet and look at technology as, you know, it, it's like a knife. You can use it as a weapon or a tool. And it's totally up to you. But I see positivity coming out of everything. It's just a matter of sorting through the nonsense to try to find that. An in individual has to do that their own way. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my video.